Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Brad Dotto, with my co host, Michael Bird. Thanks, Brad. As a business and healthcare law firm, we're often immersed in the heavy details of a particular issue or project. It's beneficial, if not mandatory, to every so often take a step back and evaluate the bigger picture. This season's theme is Zoom Out. We have all been immersed in the life of a global pandemic, and so we're going to make sure with each story that we step back and look at how the issue we discuss will be impacted in our new normal. Today, though, we're going to meet COVID head on, Brad. We're going to focus on the impact of COVID-19 that um, it had you know, on 2020 and 2021. And Brad, I don't know if you remember, but it's just been about a year ago that we actually had a special episode with uh, Paul Frank where we talked about his COVID experience. Yeah, he was one of the first seasons. Yeah, and you know, as you said, we're halfway through the year right now in 2021, and it feels like this is a good time as any to really address head on the, the pandemic. Um, you know, the infection rates are steadily declining, and although we're not completely in the clear, we we all feel like we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And, um, you know, Michael, we're not discounting any of those new Delta variants or any other risk associated COVID, but we don't want to spend um, all the time talking about all this is from COVID variants. Um, we feel like it's essential, as we said, just take a big step back. But, Michael, before we get into the pandemic talk, on a happier note, you know, you and I just recently got back from a long weekend celebrating the 4th of July. It was great. I mean, I, I, we both were out of the office for a few days uh, with our respective families. I went to Austin. I know you were in El Paso. That's right. You know, and I've always enjoyed the 4th of July. Some of my oldest memories as, as a child is sitting um, in the back of my parents' Oldsmobile station wagon. And that was a kind of station wagon with the, the back, which kind of fold flat like a uh, pickup truck. And we'd sit there as little kids eating popcorn and watching uh, fireworks on the back bay of Destin, Florida. It seemed like we were always in Destin during that time frame. So in my mind, you can have uh, at least – you need to have at least fireworks uh, uh, during the 4th of July. Is, is that when you learned back then uh, how to set a palm tree on fire during a 4th of July celebration? I can either confirm or deny whether or not any fireworks may or may not have been launched into a palm tree or had contri- contributed maybe to the pruning of one palm tree. Um, but, uh, Michael, what is your childhood memory of celebrating the 4th of July? I feel like you just redirected there, but okay, <laughs> fine. We all, we know what happened. Do we? Yeah, I think we do. We'll call the uh, <laughs> the locals, local yeah. police and see. Anyway, yeah, no, I... I when I think back to my childhood, I, I grew up in Dallas, and there was a parade that at the time was just magical because our neighborhood would put together a float, and everyone would participate, and everyone would basically just run free, um, you know, until midnight that night. And the parents were, I realize now, having their own parent fun. <laughs> I was too busy running around with all the kids to realize why they kept going back to that big thing that I now know is a keg. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's a fun memory. Uh, it has a little bit of a Mardi Gras twing to it, so uh, I can relate in lots of different ways. Um, but, you know, as you mentioned, you know, when we started this episode, we're going to be talking about zooming out. And we're looking back at this impact that COVID had um, on us and, and really then start addressing where we are now. Um, And we're going to examine how the pandemic affected our lives, both professionally and personally, and how it actually impacted our clients. Um, So let's start with how COVID impacted us professionally. And Michael, since we all know that you love context, let's start back in January of 2020, uh, Super Bowl weekend. You and I were in Vegas, and some people are talking about this thing called COVID-19, but it really wasn't really the, the, the major discussions. Yeah, it's really weird to think about it in retrospect, and it wasn't just you and I. I mean, we had our entire team there for the medical spa show, Mm -hmm. and uh, we had taken more of our team than at any other conference, and it was uh, just vibrant. We had there was so much energy uh, behind uh, a bunch of us. I think maybe six, seven attorneys speaking at different things, and. I kept hearing, you know, about this COVID that was 
so far away that it almost didn't feel real, yeah. and it certainly didn't feel real to me. And it's crazy that that was just, you know, the Super Bowl weekend, not far away from, you know, everything changing. Yeah. And so let's fast forward a little bit. Let's jump to March 11th of 2020. This is the day where the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to be a global pandemic. And at this point, the number of cases were, were increasing by like something like 13-fold. Um, and, uh, you know, with it first being obviously identified in def- uh, since, since its first identification in, de- in December. And then we started learning these new vocabulary words like flatten the curve and social distancing. That was spreading around the country probably just as fast as COVID was. And no one knew what to expect, um, but the, the shock waves of, of the pandemic, they were leaving the mark. We were tracking it like everyone else would be. And at this point, no one was wearing masks or show, social distancing. We were all just working together like it was normal. Yeah, and we started having more calls from our clients asking if they had to shut down. It was What was really weird was that California got hit with COVID first before us, so it still wasn't quite real to us mm-hmm. and yet you know in these different areas of the country we're we're getting these phone calls that just are felt like foreign questions about yeah. whether they had to close their business and uh, and then we're trying to talk to our employees and and we're you know all on the same page not ever any of us I mean Brad you probably were alive in the last pandemic but we'll <laughs> we'll we won't go there uh trying to figure out what we do as a firm. And, um, you know, everyone was talking about heading home for 14 days. And I remember, you know, we, you and I meeting with our office manager uh, specifically on Wednesday, March 11th, 2020, and, you know, talking about having to work from home remotely for 14 days to flatten the curve. Yeah, and it was our operations team, hats off to them. They did an amazing job. They quickly determined that we need a couple more laptops, and uh, so on Wednesday, they went out and got them, and by Friday, March 13th, 2020, we pulled everyone in our big conference room and said, hey, we're all going to flatten the curve here. We're going to go home in 14 days, and we'll we'll see you thereafter. Yeah, and the, the, we, you know, there was a clear understanding that this was not a break. Uh, we wanted to provide uninterrupted service to our clients during a time of deep uncertainty and really test our platform yep. that was built for people to work remote, but never tested to see if our entire office could could be remote. And, uh, you know, it ended up being really helpful for everyone. Our, our clients needed us more than ever, uh, even though we didn't have the answers. <laughs> we were uh, there to try to find them and be there with them as a someone to at least listen. And, you know, they, I think one of the things they've appreciated about us is that, you know, we are lifelong learners and we were jumping in real time to uh, laws and trying to figure them out. I, I still have uh, painful flashbacks when I hear PPP loan, but, <laughs> um, you know, with clients in nearly 50 states and everyone having different rules and different because of depending on where COVID was yep. and how they were dealing with it. We were pivoting and digesting new rules uh, on a daily basis, uh, uh, unlike anything either of us had ever experienced in our careers. Yeah, you know, and we quickly realized that we couldn't keep this pace of just having to have every single client have a, a single phone call with them and answering the same question over and over again, even on the times when we figured out the answer. And that's when we, we decided, you know, we need to start releasing certain like daily videos about what's happening. So basically, five days a week, um, we started releasing up videos of what's happening nationally or, or on state levels, what was trending. And, and in a, during a very short period of time, we actually ended up doing over 60 videos um, the first few months um, just because our, our clients really needed that. Um, and then besides you know, keeping up with all the new regulations and releasing videos, we still had clients that had regular business that we had to be attended to. And so we had non-COVID stuff that we were working on too. And I know for you and I, they were obscene, I mean, just crazy hours. We were working seven days a week. I mean, I remember having phone calls with you at 5.30 in the morning, and that became very normal for us because that was the time we had to get up and get going. Yeah, every time we would catch up on a new rule, the state, local, or federal government might change another one. Yep. 
and we'd spent hours discussing it'd be something with the SBA, <laughs> the understanding the difference between the IDLE loan and the PPP <laughs> loan, and how do they interact with each other? And you know, the the people writing these laws were figuring it out on their on the fly. Yep. And so it it wasn't uh, you know it it was everyone was learning real time mm-hmm. and. Uh, you know, so abiding by state versus medical board rules, and finally the labor laws with you know furloughs. You know, I had, hadn't used the word furlough in the first twenty five years of practicing, uh, and then all of a sudden that was a daily conversation piece. So, you know, one of my favorite stories just to really paint the picture of what life was like is uh, I, I know you talked to a surgeon here in Texas. At seven o'clock on a Sunday, uh, because he, the client wanted to know if he could operate the next day yep. in his surgery center, and and the answer at the time was yes. You were right. You said yes, he could do it. And I saw some flash come by um, that I woke up to that morning, and you and I got on the phone at you know five in the morning that the medical board had issued something banning that procedure from being able to happen, those types of procedures. And so you, you, you were left scrambling with, uh, giving advice on something that changed just a few hours later. I know. I mean, who would have thought that Sunday night, you know, we'd have a call it and two or three hours later on Sunday, I think it was like nine, nine thirty at night is the, the medical board released an emergency order prohibiting everything effective and immediately. So yeah, that was a 5 a.m. wake up call that was pretty rude. Luckily, we had the client's cell phone number, so I was able to text him and let him know that all the surgeries he had planned for that day was now basically against the rules. Um, you know, and, and so that was just that was an interesting time of just sh- things shifting so fast you couldn't keep up with it. And then as a firm, you know, we were meeting weekly on our budget um, to because we had so many clients closing, it was impacting their ability to, um, across the board to, that which in impacted us. Um, and so we, we had to look at our payroll and our, and our lease, our two basic expenses uh, weekly on a, on a budgetary sense. But I will say I was pretty proud of how it, we, it all worked out because we were able to keep all our employees at their salary. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with a lot of thanks to our Access Plus program, which I know we've talked about before, but that, that helped us sur- that prove it, it survived the pandemic. Um, and at the same time, we were able to add new clients during this pandemic who were either watching our videos or just knew that they needed help. Yeah, I can't I can't overstate the gratitude that we feel uh, for our clients, you know, sticking with us and and they needed us and they used us. But, you know, they were closed. I yeah. mean, it, it was for April and May, almost like you said, 90 percent of our clients were were closed for business. And, and so, you know, we we felt even more pressure to be there for them Mm -hmm. uh, because they were staying with us. And, you know, one of the cool things that we did that came out of it was we, for our Access Plus members, launched a COVID-19 toolkit, you know, on the member portal. And we just put a ton of information up there. And, you know, it kind of ties back to getting those videos out. There was so much happening. Mm -hmm. And, we had to figure out a way to disseminate information and tools in mass because there was just not enough time in the day to go one by one with uh, how fast things were changing. Yeah. You know, and I'd say, you know, b- besides that, I'm proud of the fact that we were able to connect with the, with them. We, we did some private webinars besides the, the number of power, power, number of webinars you and I did during that time was pretty crazy too. But, you know, when you were talking about the COVID-19 toolkit, that was huge because uh, that we realized that was a way for them to, to streamline information. We also released since then the OSHA and the patient toolkit. But most importantly for our loyal listeners, we launched this podcast during the, uh, the pandemic. May twenty seventh, twenty twenty, was our first uh, w- uh, introduction because you know we we love this as another form of education. In fact, still to this day, our first podcast is still the most listened to episode. And which is the crazy thing, Michael, we're in our fifth season. Yeah, further, you know, as a firm during the pandemic, it seemed like every week one of the partners was was on a webinar giving updates on these various new federal and state rules. I know that you and I both personally were experiencing the ups and downs of COVID. Working nonstop for days on end was was burning us both out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but by working from home, we, you know, there was some definite silver linings. And I'll say, you know, one of those great memories I had uh, 
is being able to sit down and have three meals a day with my kids that are the ones that are at home or in the junior high, high school years. My wife, Stephanie, works like I do. And so to sit down at lunch um, is a rare occasion. And for us to do it every single day, just as part of our routine, the kids doing their break from school and us breaking from work is going to be, uh, it is a, a great memory. Yeah. I mean, and that's similar to you, obviously working from home. Um, it was great because, uh, same, similar, I had a, we got to spend a lot of time together with the kids. And one of the things is with the school day being so short, the kids were done with their homework pretty early on. And so we said, well, this is a perfect opportunity to learn how to cook. So, uh, they started cooking dinners and every child had to pick a, a dinner each week. And no, cooking did not call for ordering pizza. That did not count. Um, we also played a lot of board games, um, and we uh, we taught my kids to play Texas Hold'em. Did you teach them how to lose? <laughs> of course they did. <laughs> um, there was a lot of bonding for the family, so it was great. And and up and you know, um, you know, obviously we're we're doing everything we're supposed to be doing, but in December of 2020, um, we got to spend some extra time together because my beautiful daughter Madeline decided that uh, for for Christmas she was going to give everyone COVID. So uh, that was lots of fun, and we were blessed because not one of us. Got seriously uh, sick from it, but we quarantined like we were supposed to and rode Christmas out with COVID. What about you, Michael? I know you have a fun story about COVID. Yeah, I'll say just to add to your story first, Brad, I just re- remember talking to you on the phone and talking about how y'all were doing Christmas as, uh, you know, not all the family had COVID yet and y'all were trying to distance and it was just crazy how impactful that was. But yes, yeah. um, my, uh, oldest daughter, Caroline, got engaged during COVID mm-hmm. and planned a wedding during COVID. And the wedding was in September of 2020. Mm-hmm. So there was still all these, uh, COVID was still live and kicking, no vaccine yet, obviously. And on the Tuesday before Caroline's wedding, my young, uh, middle daughter, Ava, who's a freshman in high school, got COVID. And that seems bad enough until you start to play out what that means. And what that meant was that our entire family was under quarantine. And that meant that we were not able to go to Caroline's wedding. And, uh, and so for a few days, it is just as awful as you, everyone picturing that would be and having to tell Caroline and having to listen and see her process and realize that her dad was not going to walk her down the aisle um, was just, was devastating. And, um, but you know, after a couple of days, we all as a family do what most families do, do and rallied. And, you know, this was not about anyone that was at our house. It was about Caroline and Gabe, her husband. And, uh, and so we used Zoom as a means to be, participate in the wedding. They set up some AV there so that, I could give the toast, and uh, and then my dad stepped in and walked Caroline as a surrogate down the aisle, and uh, had FaceTime for me to be able to give her away. And the the cool thing happened uh, that day of the wedding was a, a a friend of mine who happens to be a news reporter called me to or texted me to play tennis, and I was explaining to him why I was not available. And his response was, wow, that'd be a great story. And fast forward a bunch of texts back and forth. And we led the uh, 10 o'clock news here in Dallas where they uh, ran a news story on us doing a virtual wedding. And you can actually Google Caroline Bird Wedding and see the video and see uh, our view of Caroline getting married. And, and for those uh, who who want to see it, what's the funniest part? I actually happen to watch it live. The newscaster starts off with "Cowboys lose again, but local family finds a way to have a wedding with COVID," and goes straight to Michael Bird's story, which is funny. Is that the Cowboys lose again? <laughs> this was an afterthought. <laughs> oh man. Well, those are good times for all of us, Michael. You know, let's take a little break here, and when we come back, we're going to spend some time talking about the impact COVID had on our clients the medical industry, and where we are now. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? 
For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Welcome back to Legal 123s with Bird Adato. I'm your host, Brad Adato, with my co-host, Michael Bird. Michael, we just spent the first half um, of this episode really discussing the impact um, that COVID had on this pandemic had on us professionally and personally. But let's discuss the impact it had on our clients, especially those in the medical industry. Yeah, well, this hopefully will be, you know, a little less emotional than us having to relive missed weddings and (laughs) different Christmases. But uh, we first, you you know, noticed the impact with our clients when we all were learning how to use this new program called Zoom, which Obviously, for us with uh, offices in Chicago, we were a little ahead of the curve and we already had yep. Zoom meetings. But uh, there was Zoom for meetings, there was Zoom for calls, Zoom for webinars, Zoom for happy hours mm-hmm. and lunches. Oh, yeah. Uh, lots of Zoom. And I remember one of our good friends and clients uh, telling us that he could not attend another Zoom meeting, that he was zoomed out. Yes, that's uh, that's a real term, zoomed out. Um, Yeah, and so, you know, during this time frame, we had a lot of clients that uh, in the beginning, they started being shut down by state rules. Um, So they had all this extra time. And so since they had all this extra time, they wanted to learn, you know, more stuff. Uh, So I remember there there being a lot of those kind of questions. But uh, essentially, you know, what it came down to is, um, you know, with with all the different groups that we work with, and we we have a very large... uh, plethora of, of, of doctors with lots of different specialties and based on the different backgrounds, overnight, some of them all of a sudden learned that they were no longer essential. Um, and so they, this threw them off a lot. Um, and so I know that you and I had a lot of frustrated physicians that we'd speak with during the beginning of this pandemic saying, what do you mean I'm not essential? You know, I, I do this, I do that. I'm, I'm a surgeon. What I do is essential. Who has the right to do that? Um, and they felt like they could find ways to, to safely reopen. Yeah, and I I just am laughing because I'm thinking back to some of the advice that I would give, and a week later would just shudder that that those words came out of my mouth. <laughs> and at the beginning, when we were you know this idea of COVID coming, I just I remember telling people, ah, oh, you know, I mean, you're you're this is a medical practice. They're, they're not gonna. I can't imagine them shutting down a medical practice. Right. And uh, and you know over and over, and then all of a sudden. You know, I think I mentioned earlier about ninety percent of our practices were closed. I mean, in Texas, the shutdown was extreme. I mean, it was it was not um, you know it wasn't just elective medicine. I mean, the brought the breadth of what they closed was was uh, was amazing. And but you know, it was really cool to see kind of the entrepreneurial spirit come out of our clients and learn how to innovate during this pandemic and we saw people take hold of telemedicine for the first time even though it's been around forever and come up with some processes that w- probably will stick to this day and uh, and then I just I mean I can remember you know online stores being opened to sell products and you know to all sorts of different ideas of uh, how they would pivot themselves during this pandemic Speaking of telemedicine, Michael, I think we should be doing an entire uh, episode of the season for that. But yeah, our clients did love uh, telemedicine. Uh, you and I have been speaking on telemedicine for years, but uh, it was it was new to a lot of people um, who had never used it before. So it was great because they could maximize the time they spent with the patient by diagnosing and coming up with a treatment plan for them. But then they could would minimize the actual time they spent in person with the patient so it allowed the, the you know these practices to really reevaluate what technologies they were using, and the pandemic also exposed you know some practices that were behind the times. Yep. And if they did not have a digital platform to run their practice, it was uh, extra painful. If, if you know if they were still using paper charts and trying to scan it into the system, it exposed you know, the weaknesses of having to have people in the office versus 
being able to just record it in, you know, kind of a secure digital cloud type yeah, system. That's a great point, you know. And what we learn with more people using digital me- medical records and working from home, it also increased the cyber tax on the medical industry. Uh, many businesses have not spent the time or effort to really secure their systems or their computers, uh, allowing hackers to take advantages of where these weaknesses were. Uh, and unfortunately, we did have a few clients that got hit with cyber attacks, um, but the medical industry as a whole was had the biggest impact in any other industry during during COVID. And uh, we, you know, we could do probably an entire episode on cyber attacks. I think you just hit on something. I think uh, we should uh, have Riley here make that note for next season. And, uh, you know, the practice, the pandemic also exposed those practices that were overstaffed. Uh, many of our clients, when they were shut down, had to furlough their employees. I mentioned this earlier, just, you know, having to figure out exactly what that meant mm-hmm. legally. Everyone knew the term furlough, but we just, in our industry, people either are employed or fired, yeah. not furloughed. And, uh, and so, but then we had this weird thing where our clients were closed for months. And, you know, what does that mean for an HR perspective? Yeah. What are those implications? And, um, you know, then they come back and realize they don't need the same number of employees. Um, so they, they, uh, you know, how do they handle that? And then, of course, there was an impact on their forgiveness of their federal loans that yep. come in. So, yeah, I mean, all, all those uh, tied to each other. And I, I think some of the hardest conversations we have with a lot of the clients was, was always about their employees as they started to come back, as you were talking about, that they were had to really work. You know, we we had clients spending hours educating their staff about why it was safe to come back in and how they were going to have the proper PPE for them and the, how they're going to do social distancing and how for some of them they could still work from home. But the new processes of bringing on a patient or cleaning the rooms, all these new precautions that they never did. <laughs> you know, the simplest one everyone can relate to is, oh, and every single time you come in, we're going to do a temperature check on you. Yeah, and it, it, if you think about it, I mean, it really – brought out the fact that all of us as people respond differently to these pressures and the pandemic being something new to everyone. You saw all sorts of reactions. You had challenges from employers who would have employees who were afraid to come in, mm-hmm. even though you know they were open and it was time to come back. Or you would have the opposite, where employees – were maybe not feeling well, but they felt the pressure to keep their job and they would still show up and maybe even have a fever. And, uh, and so, you know, it, it took a while for everyone to kind of accept that, you know, you had to check yourself yep. with this pandemic and, uh, and work from home if things weren't, weren't right. Agree. And, you know, in this season, as we said from the beginning, this is all about zooming out. And as part of the zoom out of our theme, um, you know, we talk about taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture. So, you know, we, we've talked about all the positive notes that we saw with our clients and our team, um, the resilience of a lot of people, um, as we were talking about them finding new ways to interact with their employees, finding new ways to interact with their patients. And while each person's situation is going to be different, uh, many learn that w- through the experience that through tremendous hardship allows us to learn how we can overcome some of the toughest moments in life. Yeah. And we, we wear that on our sleeves. We have, uh, one of our three core values is compete. And when we talk to people that are interviewing with us, we were, we say we're talking about grit and that is our ability as a team to get back to back when things are down and work through things together and time and time again throughout our careers, we've done that. And it's been something that's made uh, Bertadotto resilient and special. And yet we were getting tested at a level we had never seen mm-hmm. with this pandemic. And, and you know, I know you and I both are just so proud of how every single person that worked here responded and um, stepped up in a different way. And, uh, and then – you know, really brought to light our other two core values of communicate and create because uh, being remote put a lot of pressure on figuring out ways to effectively communicate with each other Mm -hmm. and with our clients. And, you know, I feel like we were having to think outside the box on a daily basis 
with the challenges that were that were presented to us. And um, so, you know, we we produce the as you mentioned, videos, podcasts, webinars, the toolkits, all as a way to you know reach our reach our client base and provide education in a way that was different than we used to, which was showing up to conferences and mm-hmm. lecturing. And yeah. that was obviously off the table. All true, Michael, but let's discuss where are we now. Um, as we discuss uh, over and over again, COVID really put a big, sh- huge strain on all of us in every different aspect of our lives, um, which is why we're seeing this massive migration in the job market known as the Great Resignation. Of course, that's the buzzword they're using. And for those not familiar with the term the Great Resignation, millions of people are quitting their jobs. According to the Labor Department, a record 4 million people quit their jobs alone in April, which is basically a 20-year high. And according to Monster.com, 95% of the workers are now considering changing jobs or and or 92% are even willing to switch industries. And Michael, unfortunately, we're seeing this happening with our clients and even our firm. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, you know, recently went on vacation and and experienced it in a way that probably most can see or have experienced trying to get on a flight. We were worried about whether our flight would get canceled because uh, the airline's understaffed. And then we would go to restaurants and they would apologize that it was going to be, um, you know, a little longer because they were understaffed. And we're getting more and more calls from our clients having to work through, you know, implications of, of them being understaffed, trying to help them wanting to understand the, uh, you know, scope of practice of people. So if, you know, if you have an RN leave, but you still have an esthetician there, what can that esthetician pick up um, or, you know, so on and so forth. And in the professional world, there's those types of implications. And as you mentioned, you know, we're experiencing it here. It's, it is really painful. But I mean, since the vaccinations have come out, we've had uh, more people that have uh, resigned here than probably our entire history. Yeah, and uh, and it, I think it's just a reality that everyone is taking stock of their lives um, after getting through something as traumatic as uh, the pandemic, and um, and so there's just going to be a continued impact and a lot of change, and and um, I think that you know we all have to be mindful as you know, obviously attorneys for businesses and as business owners on on uh, how to respond to that. Yeah, this, it's great and um, all good points. And it, it, the hardest part about all of this is that, you know, each person's story, no matter where they are, is going to be unique to them. And it's it's the question of, of a lot of people, because they were at home, had that time to reflect, what do I really want to do in my life? Do I really want to be doing this type of profession? I've talked to people who are switching uh, complete careers uh, out of whatever their training is. So I, you know, I, I love what I do, so I, I don't understand it um, per se, but I understand that it, for each person, you, you're going to look at it from a different angle. Uh, but Michael, um, you know, any other follow-up comments on, uh, on, on that? I'm just happy not to be wearing a mask. <laughs> I mean, I got to go to the 4th of July celebration just recently, and, and A, there was a lot of humans near each other, which was cool. I was in an area that was not under a fire ban, which was cool because there was fireworks, and I didn't have to have a mask on, which uh, it's amazing how quickly I've gotten used to not having to wear a mask. Good times. Well, I think that's all the time we have today. Join us next Wednesday for something completely different, speaking the language of non-competes with Lisa Dolge. Yep, it's going to be a good one. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, if you like this episode, please subscribe. Make sure to give us a five-star rating and share with your friends. You can also sign up for the Bertadotto newsletter by going to our website at bertadotto.com. Bertadotto is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bertadotto. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.